the book of life by upton sinclair chapter nine the choosing of life discusses the standards by which we may judge what is best in life and decide what we wish to make of it we have made the point about evolution that it may go forward or it may go backward there is no guarantee in nature that because a thing changes it must necessarily become better than it was on the contrary degeneration is as definitely established a fact as growth and it is of the utmost importance in studying the problem of human happiness and how to make it to get clear the fact that nature has produced and continues to produce all kinds of monstrosities and parasites and failures and abortions and all of these blunders of our great mother struggle just as hard desire life just as ardently as normal creatures and suffer just as cruelly when they fail blind optimism about life is just as fatuous and just as dangerous as blind pessimism and if we propose to take charge of our life and to make it over we shall find that we have to get quickly to the task of deciding what our purpose is choose well your choice is brief and yet endless says carlyle you are driven in your choice by two facts first that you have to choose regardless of whether you want to or not and second that upon your choice depend infinite possibilities of happiness or of misery the interdependence of life is such that you are choosing not merely for the present but for the future you are also choosing for your posterity forever and to some extent you are choosing for all mankind matthew arnold has said that conduct is three-fourths of life but i for my part have never been able to see where he got his figures it seems to me that conduct is practically everything in life that really counts conduct is not merely marriage and birth and premature death it is not merely eating and drinking and sleeping it is thinking and aspiring it is religion and science music and literature and art it is not yet the lightning and the cyclone but with the spread of knowledge it is coming to be these things and i suspect that some day it may be even the comet and the rising of the sun we are now going to apply our reason to this enormous problem of human conduct we are going to ask ourselves the question what kind of life do we want what kind of life are we going to make what are the standards by which we may know excellence in life and distinguish it from failure and waste and blunder in life obviously when we have done this we shall have solved the moral problem all we shall have to say is act so that your actions help to bring the desirable things into being and do not act so as to hinder or weaken them we shall not be able to go to nature to settle this question for us this is our problem not nature's but we shall find as usual that we can pick up precious hints from her we shall be wise to study her ways and learn from her successes and her failures we are proud of her latest product ourselves let us see how she made us and what were the stages on the way to man first in the scale of evolution it appears came inert matter we call it inert because it looks that way though we know of course that it consists of infinite numbers of molecules vibrating with speed which we can measure even though we cannot imagine it this matter is enormously fascinating and a wise man will hesitate to speak patronizingly about it nevertheless considering matter apart from the mind which studies it we decide that it represents a low stage of being we speak contemptuously of stones and clods and lumps of clay 
we award more respect to things like mountains and tempest-tossed oceans because they are big in the early days of our race we used to worship these things but now we think of them merely as the raw material of life and we should not be in the least interested in becoming a mountain or an ocean almost everyone would agree therefore that what we call life is a higher and more important achievement of nature and if we wish to grade this life we do so according to its sentience that is to say the amount and intensity of the consciousness which grows in it we are interested in the one-celled organisms which swarm everywhere throughout nature and we study the mysterious processes by which they nourish and beget themselves we suspect that they have a germ of consciousness in them but we are sure of the meaning and importance of the consciousness we detect in some complex organism like a fish or bird we learn to know the signs of consciousness of dawning intelligence and we esteem the various kinds of creatures according to the amount of it they possess we reject mere physical bigness and mere strength joyce kilmer may write poems are made by men like me but only god can make a tree and that seems to us a charming bit of fancy but the common sense of the thing is voiced to us much better in the lines of old ben jonson it is not growing like a tree in bulk doth make man better be if we take two animals of equal bulk the hippopotamus and the elephant we shall be far more interested in the elephant because of the intelligence and what we call character which he displays there are good elephants and bad elephants kind ones and treacherous ones we love the dog because we can make a companion of him that is because we can teach him to react to human stimuli of all animals we are fascinated most by the monkey because he is nearest to man and displays the keenest intelligence someone may say that this is all mere human egotism and that we have no way of really being sure that the life of elephants and hippopotami is not more interesting and more significant than the life of men never having been either of these animals i cannot say with assurance but i know that i have the power to exterminate these creatures or to pen them in cages and they are helpless to protect themselves or even to understand what is happening to them so i am irresistibly driven to conclude that intelligence is more safe and more worthwhile than unintelligence in short that intelligence is nature's highest product up to date and that to foster and develop it is the best guess i can make as to the path of wisdom that is of intelligence when we come to deal with human values we find that we can trace much of the same kind of evolution back in the days of the caveman it was physical strength which dominated the horde but nowadays except in the imagination of the small boy the strong man does not cut much of a figure we go once perhaps to see him lift his heavy weights and break his iron bars but then we are tired of him mere strength had to yield in the struggle for life to quickness of eye and hand to energy which for lack of a better name we call nervous the pugilist who has nothing but muscle goes down before his lighter antagonist who can keep out of his reach and the crowd loves the football hero who can duck and dodge and make the long runs one might cite a thousand illustrations such as the british bowmen breaking down the heavily armored knights or the quick moving light vessels of the british overcoming the huge galleons of spain and as society develops and becomes more complex the fighting man becomes less and less a man of muscle and more and more a man of nerve alexander caesar and napoleon would have stood a poor chance in personal combat against many of their followers they led because they were men of energy and cunning able to maintain the subtle thing we call prestige now the world has moved into an industrial era 
and those who are the great men of our time the men whose lightest words are heeded whose doings are spread upon the front pages of our newspapers obviously they are men of money we may pretend to ourselves that we do not really stand in awe of a morgan or a rockefeller but that we admire let us say an edison or a roosevelt but edison himself is a man of money and will tell you that he had to be a man of money in order to be free to conduct his experiments as for our politicians and statesmen they either serve the men of money or the men of money suppress them as they did roosevelt the morgans and the rockefellers do not do much talking they do not have to they content themselves with being obeyed and the shaping of our society is in their hands and yet some of us really believe that there are higher faculties in man than the ability to manipulate the stock market we consider that the great inventor the great poet the great moralist contributes more to the human happiness than the man who by cunning and persistence succeeds in monopolizing some material necessity of human life poets says shelley are the unacknowledged legislators of mankind if this strange statement is anywhere near to truth it is surely of importance that we should decide what are the higher powers in men and how they may be recognized and how fostered and developed what is in its essence the process of evolution from the lower to the higher forms of mental life it is a process of expanding consciousness the developing of ability to apprehend a wider and wider circle of existence to share it to struggle for it as we do for the life we call our own the test of the higher mental forms is therefore a test of universality of sympathetic inclusiveness or to use commoner words it is a test of enlightened unselfishness every human individual has the will to life the instinct of self-preservation which persuades him that he is of importance but the test of his development is his ability to realize that important though he may be he is but a small part of the universe and his highest interests are not in himself alone his highest duties are not owed to himself alone and as the life becomes more of the intellect this fact becomes more and more obvious more and more dominating men who monopolize the material things of the world and their control are necessarily self-seeking but in the realm of the higher faculties this element in the very nature of the case is forced into the background it is evident that truth is not truth for the standard oil company nor for j p morgan and company nor yet for the government of the united states it is truth for the whole of mankind and one who sincerely labors for the truth does so for the universal benefit there may be of course an element of selfishness in the activities of poets and inventors they may be seeking for fame they may be hoping to make money out of their discoveries but the greatest men we know have been dominated by an overwhelming impulse of creation and when we read their lives and discover in them signs of petty vanity or jealousy or greed we are pained and shocked what touches us most deeply is some mark of self-consecration and humility as for example when newton tells us that after all his life's labors he felt himself as a little child gathering seashells on the shore of the great ocean of truth or when alfred russell wallace discovering that darwin had been working longer than himself over the theory of the origin of the species generously withdrew and permitted the theory to go to the world in darwin's name there are three faculties in man usually described as intellect feeling and will according as one or the other faculty predominates we have a great scientist a great poet or a great moralist 
we might choose a representative of each type let us say newton shakespeare and jesus and spend much time in controversy as to which of these three types is the greatest which makes the greatest contribution to human happiness but it will suffice here to point out that the three faculties do not exclude one another every man must have all three and a perfectly rounded man should seek to develop all three jesus was considerable of a poet and we should pay far less heed to shakespeare if he had not been a moralist also there have been instances of great poets and painters who were scientists for example leonardo and goethe the fundamental difference between the scientist and the poet is that one is exploring nature and discovering things which actually exist whereas the other is creating new life out of his own spirit but the poet will find that his creations take but little hold upon life if they are not guided and shaped by a deep understanding of life's fundamental nature and needs in other words if the poet is not something of a scientist and in the same way the very greatest discoveries of science seem to us like leaps of creative imagination as if the mind had completed nature through some intuitive and sympathetic understanding of what nature wished to be the point about these higher forms of human activity is that they renew and multiply life we may say that if jesus had never lived others would have embodied and set forth with equal poignancy the revolutionary idea of the equality of all men as children of one common father and perhaps this is true but we have no way of being sure that it is true and as we look back upon the last nineteen hundred years of human history we are unable to imagine just what the life of mankind during those centuries would have been if jesus had died when he was a baby we do not know what modern thought might have been without kant or what modern music might have been without beethoven we are forced to admit that if it had not been for the patient wisdom and persuasive kindness of lincoln the slave power might have won its independence and america today might have been a military camp like europe and the lives and thoughts of every one of us would have been different or take the activities of the poet many years ago the writer was asked to name the men who had exercised the greatest influence upon him and after much thought he named three jesus hamlet and shelley and now consider the significance of this reply one of the people shelley was what we call a real person that is a man who actually lived and walked upon the earth concerning hamlet it is believed that there once was a prince of denmark by that name but the character who is known to us as hamlet is the creation of a poet's brain as to the third figure jesus the authorities dispute some say that he was a man who actually lived others believe that he was god on earth yet others very learned maintain that he is a legendary name around which a number of traditions have gathered to me it does not make a particle of difference which of these three possibilities happens to be true about jesus if he was god on earth he was god in human form under human limitations and in that sense we are all gods on earth and whether he really lived or whether some poet invented him matters not a particle so far as concerns his effect upon others the emotions which moved him the loves the griefs the high resolves existed in the soul of someone whether his name were jesus or john and these emotions have been recorded in such form that they communicate themselves to us they become a part of our souls they make us something different from what we were before we encountered them in other words the poet makes in his own soul a new life and then projects it into the world 
and it becomes a force which makes over the lives of millions of other people. If you read the vast mass of criticism which has grown up around the figure Hamlet, you learn that Hamlet is the type of the modern man. Shakespeare was able to divine what the modern man would be, or perhaps we can go farther and say that Shakespeare helped to make the modern man what he is. The modern man is more of Hamlet, because he has taken Hamlet to his heart and pondered over Hamlet's problem. Or take Don Quixote. No doubt the follies of the age of chivalry would have died out of men's heart in the end, but how much sooner they died because of the laughter of Cervantes. Or take Les Miserables. Our prison system is not ideal by any means, but it is far less cruel than it was half a century ago, and we owe this in part to Victor Hugo. Every convict in the world is to some degree a happier man because of this vision which was projected upon the world from the soul of one great poet. No one can estimate the part which the writings of Tolstoy have played in the present revolution in Russia, but this we may say with certainty. There is not one man, woman, or child in Russia at the present moment who is quite the same as he would have been if resurrection had never been written. In discussing the highest faculties of man, we have so far refrained from using the word genius. It is a word which has been cheapened by misuse, but we are now in position to use it. The things which we have just been considering are the phenomena of genius. And we can say this even though we may not know exactly what genius is. Perhaps it is, as Frederick Myers asserts, a subliminal uprush, the welling up into consciousness of some part of the content of the subconscious mind. Or perhaps it is something of what man calls divine. Or perhaps it is the first dawning, the first hint of that super race which will some day replace mankind. Perhaps we are witnessing the same thing that happened on earth when the glimmerings of reason first broke upon the mind of some poor, bewildered ape. We cannot be sure. But this much we can say, the man of genius represents the highest activity of the mind of which we as yet have knowledge. He represents the spirit of man, fully emancipated, fully conscious, and taking up the task of creation, taking human life as raw material and making it over into something more subtle, more intense, more significant, more universal than it ever was before, or ever would have been, without the intervention of this new God-man. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 Myself and my neighbor compares the new morality with the old and discusses the relative importance of our various duties. So now we may say that we know what are the great and important things in life. Slowly and patiently, with infinite distress and waste and failure, but yet inevitably, the life of man is being made over and multiplied to infinity by the power of the thinking mind, impelled by the joy and thrill of the creative action and guided by the sense of responsibility, the instinct to serve, which we call conscience. To develop these higher faculties is the task we have before us and the supreme act to which we dedicate ourselves. So now we are in a position to define the word moral. Assuming that our arguments be accepted, that action is moral which tends to foster the best and highest forms of life we know, and to aid them in developing their highest powers. That is immoral which tends to destroy the best life we know, or to hinder its rapid development. Let us now proceed to apply these tests to the practices of man, first as an individual, and then as a social being. 
what are my duties to myself and what are my duties to the world about me you will note that these questions differ somewhat from those of the old morality jesus told us first that we should love the lord our god and second that we should love our neighbor as ourself some would say that modern thought has dismissed god from consideration but i would prefer to say that modern thought has decided that the place where we encounter God most immediately is in our miraculously expanding consciousness. Our duty toward God is our duty to make of ourselves the most perfect product of the divine incarnation that we can become. Our duty to our neighbor is to help him do the same. Of course, as we come to apply these formulas, we find that they overlap and mingle inextricably. The two duties are really one duty looked at from different points of view. We decide that we owe it to ourselves to develop our best powers of thinking, and we discover that in so doing we make ourselves better fitted to live as citizens, better equipped to help our fellow men. We go out into our city to serve others by making the city clean and decent, and we find that we have helped to save ourselves from a pestilence. The most commonly accepted, or at any rate the most commonly preached of all formulas, is the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. This formula is good so far as it goes but you note that it leaves undetermined the all-important question, what ought we to want others to do unto us? If I am an untrained child, what I would have others do unto me is to give me plenty of candy. Therefore, under the golden rule, my highest duty becomes to distribute free candy to the world. The golden rule is obviously consistent with all forms of self-indulgence and with all forms of stagnation it might result in a civilization more static than china or let us take the formula which the german philosopher kant worked out as the final product of his thinking act so that you would be willing for your action to become a general rule of conduct here again is the same problem there are many possible general rules of conduct some would prefer one some others and there is no possible way of escape from the fact that before men can agree what to do they must decide what they wish to make of their lives to the formula of jesus thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself the answer is obvious enough suppose my neighbor is not worthy of as much love as myself to be sure, it is a perilous thing for me to have to decide this question. Nevertheless, it may be a fact that I am a great inventor, and that my neighbor is a sexual pervert. There is, of course, a sense in which I may love him, even so. I may love the deeper possibilities of his nature, which religious ecstasy can appeal to and arouse. But in spite of all ecstasies and all efforts, it may be that his disease physical mental and moral has progressed to such a point that it is necessary to confine him or to castrate him or even to asphyxiate him painlessly to say that i must love such a man as myself is to say the least to be vague we can see how much the indiscriminate preaching of such a formula would open the floodgates of sentimentality and fraud modern thinking says thou shalt love the highest possibilities of life and thou shalt labor diligently to foster them moreover because life is always growing and new possibilities are forever dawning in the human spirit thou shalt keep an open mind and an inquiring temper and be ready at any time to begin life afresh such is the formula it is not simple and when we come to apply it we find that it constantly grows more complex when we attempt to decide our duty to ourselves we find that we have in us a number of different beings each with separate and sometimes conflicting duties and needs 
we have in us the physical man and the economic man and these clamor for their rights and must have at least a part of their rights before we can go on to be the intellectual man the moral man or the artistic man so our life becomes a series of compromises and adjustments between a thousand conflicting desires and duties between the different beings which we might be but can be only to a certain extent and at certain times we shall see as we come to investigate one field after another of human activity that we never have an absolute certainty never an absolute right never an absolute duty never can we shut our eyes and go blindly ahead upon one course of action to the exclusion of every other consideration on the contrary we sit in the seat of self-determination as a highly trained and skillful engineer we keep our eyes upon a dozen different gauges we press a lever here and touch a regulator there and we decide that now is the time for speed and now for caution and knowing all the time that the safety not merely of ourselves but of many passengers depends upon the decisions of each moment End of chapter 10.